Welcome to Living in the Matrix. I'm Jonathan, and I'm left of center. And I'm Rich, and I tend to lean a little bit more to the right. But the bottom line is, is together we try to look for the balance of what it means to be human in today's world. All right. Welcome, everybody, Living in the Matrix. I'm Jonathan. This is my co-host, Rich. Say hello, Rich. Hey, everybody. Great to be here. And my goodness, this is number three this week. So they say three is a charm, David. Let's go. It's going to be a good one. I guarantee you today is going to be a fantastic one. So today we have David Congdon, and David has written a uh, book on the four views of Christian universalism, which we love diving into this show because I think this is probably one of the, as I was saying to David earlier, hell is probably one of the most important subjects to deconstruct because when you do it, can radically change the way you look at Christianity and give it a life that you didn't realize was actually there. So uh, welcome, David. It is a pleasure to have you. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. So let's dive in. And why don't you give our audience sort of a quick summary of your book, Encapsulated, because there's sort of four parts. Help us understand it at a high level. Well. The book is a volume of multi, it's a multi-view volume. So I'm not the only person who has a perspective in this book. There are three others who are also in the volume. Um, I am sort of the moderator of the conversation, but I'm also a contributor to the four views. I have one of the four in the book. And, you know, the, the goal of the book is just to help people understand that universalism is not a single thing. It's, it's a, it's a, there's a range of views and ideas under the broad umbrella of Christian universalism. So the book it, it, in that sense is helping, is trying to help people to complicate the conversation, to diversify how we talk about this, this issue, not to assume that if you have, you know, one knockdown argument against one position that that somehow eradicates the whole conversation, you know, that universalism is now out. So um, the four views in the book, uh, briefly, just as, I'll just name them. There, one is on a early Christian or patristic universalism. So this is a universalism that you might find in early an church. earlier early church mm-hmm. period. Another one is an evangelical universalism, one that was more congenial to ev- contemporary American evangelicals. Uh, another one is it will be call a post Bardian universalism. So for those who don't know who Karl Barth is, he's a prominent Swiss theologian in the 20th century. His view is important for that that chapter. And then there's my own view, which I'm broadly calling an existential universalism. It's certainly the most out there in terms of the the conversation, but it's trying to show you can there's all types <laughs> can be included in this conversation. Yeah. So just so I know, as we talk about that, do you buy in hook, line, and sinker on your view, or is it sort of what you're wrestling with? Um, I, I mean, I'm hook, line, and sinker in the sense of if if we're going to have some ca- account of Christian theology, it, it had better be universalist. Um, <laughs> but I think I'm open <clears throat> to articulating that in a variety of ways. I so don't you're think- presenting as in an argument. It is an argument, right? Yeah. And I don't, I don't. Um, it, you know, I think the spirit of the book is to say you don't have to accept my 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 position to make to for me to view you as like in the right. It's just an idea uh, I'm proposing to maybe help to help people think about things a little more carefully and critically. Yeah, the, the reason well, why I ask, yeah, yeah, the quick quick is the reason why I ask is I want to make sure I understand the position that you're holding right now because i hold my understanding of my faith very lightly i can let go any part if i get introduced to new evidence that is all i just have one rule it has to be consistent with love that's it and what i find is it that always places me in a wrestling and i want to know how hard you hold on to it because i love this conversation yeah because i want to i want to be totally open to new ideas here so, yeah. I mean, I'm very open to new ideas. I don't hold my own position as being, you know, it has to be right. Exclusive. Um, my of own, course. You're wrestling my own, with it. My yes. own views have changed radically over the years, right. you know, and I'm, it's an ongoing awesome. process. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Rich, you had a question? 
Yeah, the thing I was going to mention is, well, even David Artman in his book, um, Grave Saves All, I mean, even has um, an example of the early church fathers as a summary of ways, right? Here's scripture, there's tradition, there's the early church fathers. There's almost like God is a loving father, right? And so we've got this almost um, character um, defense that even C.S. Lewis would say, listen, if there's a passage in the Bible that differs with the character of God, I go with the character of God, et cetera, right? Um, the other thing I, I wanted to, um, I'm, I'm really excited about is, you know, well, I, I want you to be aware that our audience primarily isn't really deeply theological. So in your interview with your uh, podcast um, host, you talked about pro- there's not a process theology version of um uh, of, of universalism, if you would, and we none of our folks know what the dipolar kind of aspects of God are, nor um, would they know what DBH means by default, right? If you throw out, you know, um, you know, yeah, I told them heart. That. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, so um, um, realize that our audience is open. We've seen a lot of cool things, and our stuff has ranged from talking about theology and evangelicalism and universalism to ways to heal yourself through fasting and meditation and, um, you know, ice baths and, and a lot of other kinds of constructs, right? So understand that uh, it's a pretty general audience, but um, I think that the, the general, the, tem- the, the temper of, of where we're going with this is going to be huge for people just to add another benefit, another thing, right? So um, that's all I wanted to throw out there. Thanks so much. Oh, that's great. I'm absolutely. You know what? That's a really good point, Rich, is that we don't treat this like a podcast. In other words, where we're trying to communicate information to people. We treat it as a conversation because our mm-hmm. goal is to find people who are having fascinating conversations and have them with them. And, and I think this, this, this idea has so much rich value. And I love talking about it because I think it's life-giving. So I'll ask this first because you have a unique story that I know. What is your background? Because you got to a point where you wrote this book, which is on the edges. How did you get there? Because I know you came from a pretty famous school. <laughs> um, yes. So I I grew up deep in the heart of American evangelicalism. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, I am descended from the founder of Wheaton College. So Wheaton, wow. Wheaton College is deep in my in my, my family, in my history. I grew up going to my grandparents' house down the road from where I, from where I grew up. And on my grandparents' wall is a picture of Jonathan Blanchard, the founder of Wheaton College, and you know, and, and the picture of Wheaton in 1860, you know, the original building. And I'm a sixth generation Wheaton grad, so you know, my 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 father is named Jonathan Blanchard Congdon, so it's all, you know, it's deep in there, right? So growing up, I heard about Wheaton all the time. I heard about the the origins of kind of contemporary evangelicalism constantly. My my whole family is a family of pastors and missionaries, you know, so. Um, and my grandfather was a professor of Bible and theology for 30 years. So it's uh, it's it's the world in which I was raised. It's the air that I was breathing from mm. from childhood. Um, yeah, and so I naturally, of course, I went to Wheaton <laughs> and, uh, you know, I went there as a outspoken fundamentalist. I call myself a fundamentalist to my, my roommate and my friends there. Who were your influences at that point? Who were your influences at that when you were right going into Wheaton? I mean, to be honest, it was just my my own family. If I'm fine. Nice. You nice. know, I I didn't I I wasn't trained theologically uh, as a child. My my parents were not, you know, intellectual uh, types who were going to be, you know, uh, feeding me theology and philosophy from a young age. Um, nice. uh, you had so a normal I, childhood. I had a normal childhood. Yeah, <laughs> I was. Up, yeah. I came to college to study English literature. Uh, I wanted to, you know, I was an English major. I wanted to study poetry. I was a poet. That's what I wanted to do. Um, it, but there's no I, money in poetry, though. <laughs> there's no money in poetry. No, there is not. Uh, <laughs> So I didn't care about the the nuances of biblical interpretation, theological history, all that stuff was completely right. irrelevant to me. Um, I actually didn't even know when I went to college, when I went to Wheaton, that Christians could be baptized as an infant. I didn't realize that was a thing that Christians mm, did. Right. You know, to right. me, that was like something that, you know, those pagan Catholics did, you know, <laughs> right? Like it was completely outside of my realm of experience. Um so I was utterly ignorant of theological history, church history, knew none of it. Um, but I did know that whatever my family believed was right. Mm-hmm. You know, I knew that. 
That's and what I most knew- kids want. <laughs> Right. And I knew that they were, you know, premillennial dispensationalists. That's those are big money words in evangelicalism. I didn't know the nuances of those words. I didn't know the details of those theories, but I knew that it was right. Because my grandfather believed it, my father believed it, my parents believed, you know, that that was the position. So I had to be right. And I I remember very vividly um the summer between my freshman and sophomore years in college, I, I picked up a copy of Mark Knoll's book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. If you don't mm. know that book, it was a it was a very important landmark book in the 90s that came out. And um, Knoll's book, when I read it the first time through uh, that summer, I quite literally threw it across the room. You know, I, I smashed it against the wall uh, of the, of the you know, my parents' house. And... Um, was just furious that this person who I respected because he was a professor at Wheaton College was saying such obviously heretical things. Um, And I picked the book up again about a month later towards the end of summer, read it again, and kind of had a conversion experience, you know, realized that um, maybe he's right. Maybe evangelicals don't have the 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 totality of truth in their grasp. Maybe they aren't the only right theology or position to hold. And I went into my second year at Wheaton College um, with a readiness to relearn everything from the ground up. Um, So I just said, I'll set aside everything that I've been taught and I'll just learn it afresh. And what did you, did you talk to your family about that? Uh, <laughs> like, because that's kind of a hey, I'm it's kind of leaving deal. the fold a little bit. Yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah. Did you talk to your family, or did you keep it private? Uh, I did talk to my family. You know, I, I, I had already, you know, my, my first semester at Wheaton College, I had a philosophy professor who really changed my life, and he had me read Augustine's Confessions for the first time. Mm-hmm. I never encountered Augustine. I knew, I had no idea who he was. Yeah. You know, and I read Confessions, and it blew my mind. You know, it absolutely rocked my world. Um, and I, I remember calling home to my parents and saying, Hey dad, mom, I, I read Augustine's confessions, you know, and it was incredible. And my, I remember my dad telling me on the phone, he's like, you liked your philosophy class. I I hate (laughs) it. You know, he's like, okay, you know, if you like that stuff, go ahead, read it. You know, um, he didn't care, you know, and my parents didn't care. They just, they would encourage me to read whatever I found interesting. Um, they had no, they, they couldn't comprehend why I found that interesting, <laughs> but they knew that if I was interested in it, it was okay. Cause they were very supportive parents. They were always wanting me to, to pursue whatever I was interested in at the moment. And, um, so they didn't care about whether or not I was towing the, the theological line of the family. That wasn't their concern. You felt the freedom to explore. Absolutely. I'd felt That's awesome. Freedom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. a quick question. Yeah, quick question regarding the the the, the confessions because it blew my mind. Um, because a lot of people love C.S. Lewis, then they don't in the evangelical framework, right? Um, theistic evolution. A lot of people love Augustine um, in some regards, but I'm reading this passage that says um, Augustine's on his deathbed. His mother um, says, "Don't baptize him because if he goes back to his lecherous ways after he gets baptized, what good is that going to do?" Right. So pure baptism for the mission of sins and including him praying for his dead mother so that Satan wouldn't give guile him and yes. take him off to, to his. And I'm like, Whoa, we've got, um, you know, purgatory <laughs> or, um, salvation after, you know, or some kind of things happening here. Uh-huh. What, um, were there something like that Were those kinds of things, um, kind of tickling your fancy and maybe what, was there anything else about Mark Knoll's um, book that kind of started saying, it looks like there's reasonable people, especially Augustine, who are saying things that, wait a minute, I've got to take a pause here. Well, the, the combination for me was the fact that Knoll's book was showing how, and he goes through different areas of evangelical thought, like creationism is a big part of the book, which was the part that really rocked my, me. I grew up as a mm-hmm. young earth creationist. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, but what Knoll is showing is that each of these areas in, in evangelical thought are only maybe 50, 60, 70 years old. You know, that they're you know, at most maybe a hundred years old, you know. So we're talking about a tiny sliver of Christian history in which these ideas had had sprung up. And and so for me, um, the hard thing for me to grasp was that everything I had believed from 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 childhood was resting on a foundation of of just mere decades of time and had, you know, the the it was the shakiest of foundations upon which to base myself intellectually, right? And so 
that combined with reading an ancient Christian theologian like Augustine, who I found deeply fascinating and and thoughtful and profound and a, just a beautiful writer, um, the combination of those two things was earth shattering to me because mm. here on the one hand was how shallow and and superficial my found my thought process was or what I believed was, and here's a, an ancient theologian who was deep and profound and really wrestling with things that were at a whole nother level than from what I was, what I had been thinking about or believing. Um, and so the combination of that was what really, you know, had forced me to open my mind to what else was out there. So I've never read Confessions. I should. Uh, it's a great I, book. I want to. Yeah. <laughs> you're making it sound amazing. What is the you thing have to. that stood out to you? Because you guys have both read it. What stood out to you about it? Honesty, I mean, <laughs> just absolute, um, um, almost like like just coming down to, I mean, I think he was in tears. He was wrestling with something and um, there's a there's a scene where um, he, he somehow has a sign to open the book of Romans, I think. But I mean, there's a mm -hmm. lot of different things in there. But if you actually look at it, you're looking into his heart of what's going on and what's breaking him and what's what's getting him, what's what's questioning about things and, and real life kinds of scenarios. It is a it's a confession. And and the reason why people love it is because I think when he wrote it, it is not written it's it's with intentionality. You know how we talk about these things as you as you manifest as you as you as you intentionally create love into the the, mm -hmm. the the work you do or the food you make for your family or the music you play. In this particular book, the things that he wrote were so real, so um, you know, almost tearful, almost, you know, the humanity of him just comes through shining in my mind. That's what was so powerful and brilliant too at the same time. Um, go ahead, David. I mean, I, yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think for me, um, I, I wasn't, I was just basically blown out, blown away by reading a work of theology for the first time. I mean, that mm. was for me, like, it was my first experience reading a real work of, of theological depth. Right. And so having, um, not encountered anything like that. <laughs> um, I'm encountering this this thoughtful doctrinal reflection in a very personal, uh, mm, you know, personal, mo a, a, a pious mode. Like it's very, it's 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 almost a, it's an act of worship in many ways. The book is very. He's, he's constantly praying to God in between his reflections, um, but but those reflections are deeply thoughtful. You know. Issues of creation, issues of time and eternity, you know, issues of, of sin and, and salvation. You know, these, he's wrestling with these basic questions of theology. And I had never encountered, I never read anything wrestling with those kinds of doctrines before. And, and so for me, it was just realizing, oh, like people have put serious thought into these ideas. You know, this it, question of like, time and eternity, for instance, you know, it, it, I had never... I never read anything that was wrestling with that question before. And I never thought about, Oh, maybe my like superficial idea about eternity is not there's <laughs> there. I, I could spend a lifetime unpacking just one chapter of that book and, and, and just coming to grips with that was a humbling experience. So what happened after that in terms of your growth, yeah. where did that lead you? Well, I mean, it, it, pretty quickly, as you can imagine, it, it led me to unravel some of my beliefs, <laughs> and I, I went on a process of. Uh, what was just the first to go? <laughs> um, probably my young Earth creationism. That's a pretty easy one to let go of, but that was the first thing that went. Yes, sir. And that was that was tough though because my dad was a very strong believer at that time. You know, I used to go to young Earth creation meetings in my in in the in my hometown growing up as a kid, you know, so it was, it was deep, right. That was, that was deep in the water for me. Um, but, uh, but that went, that went pretty quickly because of Noel's book. Um, and I, I, you know, I started dipping my toes into theology at that point. So I started taking classes, took a systematic theology class at Wheaton college, uh, the next year. Um, and that was opening my eyes to a whole, whole realm of work that I had never encountered before, including Carl Bart. Uh, we read Bart in that class and some other people. Um, but uh, I was also struck by these poets that I was reading. So I was still an English major <laughs> and I was still reading a lot of poetry. And I was taking a lot of courses from uh, Professor Roger Lundeen, uh, who, who uh, passed away uh, a while back, but he, uh, he was my mentor, um, and he uh, was a, a 
beloved mentor of mine. I just really changed my life. Um, but he, what he did was he did theology in some ways through literature, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, oh, wow. and exploring theological themes in, in through the books he was reading. And um, so I, I wrote some papers uh, under his guidance and some other people's guidance. I did a, uh, I did a paper on T.S. Eliot and theology and prophecy. That was that really was important for me. I did a, a, a piece on Czesław Miłosz, the Polish poet, looking at him and eschatology and Gnosticism. Um, and so like these, all these, I'm, I'm, at that point, I was just dabbling in ideas. I had no idea what I was, you mm-hmm. know, I was out of my depth, right? It was completely, I, I wasn't prepared to really deal with those topics, but I was excited by them. You know, I was thrilled to be reading these theological ideas. And so Professor Lundin recommended that I go to study at Princeton Seminary to to do my MDiv there. His goal for me was I would do the MDiv, learn theology, then do a PhD in literature and and basically do what he was doing, but in in my own way, um, kind of combining literature and theology. And I still, there's a part of me that still wishes I had done that. but when I was at Princeton, I sort of I fell in love with that topic and I realized that was really speaking to me in a way that literature wasn't at that time. And so I, I really want wanted to. Quick question. D- didn't Andrew Ronich go to Princeton? Do you know Andrew Ronich? I think he did. I yeah. think you're right. Do you know that name? Yeah. He's, he's Probably, written a book he's on. He's, he's written like, a book on, um, on, on universalism. It's a massive, massive book. Yeah, and David Artman recommended him um, on our podcast after we chatted with David. So you're familiar with obviously David Artman. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very good. Sorry about that interjection. Uh, but no, I was thinking the same. I was in the same universe <laughs> there. David, did you want to be a writer or a teacher or an editor? What did you want to do with that? Um, I mean, so from the age of 11, I knew I wanted to get my PhD and be a professor of some kind. Oh, that was good. Nice. <laughs> that, that was my life goal from the age of 11. I, I that you was see like, yourself in <laughs> Um, I mean, I think growing up, you probably do. I did, you know, just cause that was a, my, my family school, but you know, by, by the time I left Wheaton, I, I no longer, I, I no longer felt at home there. Um, you yeah, know, that's, I, that's the question I was going to ask you, yeah. did this feel like curiosity or a deconstruction? Oh, deconstruction for sure. Really? Ab- yeah. Absolutely. Oh yes. Now, yeah. Being I'm, in your family lineage, how did you feel suddenly being that far <laughs> away from where your family believed? Well, I mean, I, <laughs> I'm also so that's a, where the journey leads you in the yeah. middle of nowhere. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I in this room. <laughs> I have a combative personality at times when it comes to intellectual ideas. I mean, especially at that time, I did. <laughs> um, and I remember writing a letter to all of my aunt and uncles. Are you uh, kidding? I, Oh, announce wow. announcing kind of my distancing from them um and that was a big deal I mean, well, so my, my my father was one of 12 uh there was you know so it's a big mm-hmm. family you know and and so i wrote this letter to all of them saying you know i'm not on board <laughs> basically and uh what was the response <laughs> um a couple of them were like you know great you do your thing other people were like i'm very sad to hear that you know uh yeah. you know it's kind of typical thing, but you know, it was, <laughs> it, that was, that was okay. I mean, I think at that time, you know, at that time it was still early stages, you know? So it was like, Oh, you know, he's just, you know, differing a little bit. Um, I remember when I was uh, graduating from Wheaton college, my first cousin was also there. He, he and I were same year at Wheaton. Um, he's Doug and I'm David. So we were next to each other in line in the graduation <laughs> line. Uh, and I remember, you know, uh, talking with my, uh, you know, we were talking with our, our, our grandparents, our grandparents afterwards. And um, I, at that point had already gotten uh, 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 my letter to go to Princeton Seminary. My cousin was going to go to Dallas Seminary, Dallas Electrical Seminary, two polar opposite schools. Biggest differences. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, my grandfather went to, went to Dallas. Many of my uncles went to Dallas. Dallas is sort of a family school for us in a, in a, in a different sense. And so I remember uh, my grandmother coming up to me afterward, you know, at some point after my, after graduation and saying, you know, there's still time to go to Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> there's still time to like, to, to redeem yourself. <laughs> and my cousin, Doug, when we were standing in line at graduation, he's like, you know, Princeton needs some Christians. So it's a good thing you're going there, you know? Mm-hmm. And so there was a sense like, you know, like yeah, if you, you're going into the dark side, you're going to the, uh, you're going to them, you know, to, to, 
to the to the world of the pagans and the the liberals and the heathens and and um uh but you know, but you know you know at, at that point it was sort of like oh maybe we're losing david <laughs> you know maybe david's lost to us um and uh at that point i was i was fine with that i i knew that i needed to you know, venture out into a new world of, of thought. Uh, I couldn't stay, you know, wrapped up in just what I'd always, always heard and what I'd always believed. Um, and I was ready to do just to blow open the doors and just, you know, chart my own path away from my family, which is fine. But it, what did it, construction yeah. feel like for you? For me, liberation, you know, for me, it mm-hmm. was, uh, um, uh, uh, I mean, I, I was always intellectually curious. And so for me, the, the deconstruction was a chance to explore. It was like, it was playtime, you know, it was ready for what me. Was it was playground. Re- like, did you go all the way and say anything in the world or was it sort of still within the frame of Christianity? Cause I never lost any disconnect to Jesus ever. Um, that's good. I learned yeah. so much from Buddhism and Hinduism and, and yeah. Zoroastrian, all of them. I've learned from what was your frame at that time? I was still operating within the realm of Christianity, certainly. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and, and I think even at that stage, still a fairly narrow conversation it's, it hadn't blown that far open yet, but I was open to it. I was ready for it. You know, I was, I was prepared to go wherever it led me. Um, but, but I do. So, but here's the, but the thing is like, I was the, one of the first things I was ready to, to go over on, to change my mind on was on universalism uh, because mm. I, so when I started at Princeton seminary uh, in 2005 um, that fall um, I, I began a blog or that year I began a blog um, called the fire and the rose, which I did for a number of years. And one of the first things I did my first semester at Princeton seminary was start a blog series called why I am, why I am a universalist. And how long ago was it? So this is 2005 and 2006. So it was, it was a long blog series, you know, what kind of went yeah. on and on. It was like, it was essentially a systematic theology that I was writing um, in the form of a, of a conversation about universalism. Um, but in the mode of me kind of announcing to the world, I'm a universalist. All right. And so kind of the next step, the next stage of my theological journey was just me saying here's where i am theolo- theologically i'm definitely no longer <laughs> with with my evangelical family in where i was and um was that hard got, for you to kind of make that intellectual i was just going to say this because you talked about this new playground david people go through deconstruction and get devastated suicidal depressed there's um we had a guest on who was a mormon um mm. who went theist and then full-blown um, nihilistic, um, and now she's kind of trying to settle on a positive side of atheism where she's offering spiritual advice. A, a lot of people, uh, you can hear post-Christian. I mean, you're talking about a playground and, 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 and a casting aside the, the weights that have left you be, being free as, a, as almost, oh my God, let's go, baby, as opposed yep. to, oh, mama, help me. I'm, I'm, I'm despondent, uh, need of therapy, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Help us understand that transition. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Yeah. I never you're from the Wheaton family, brother. Come on. Yeah, I yes, it's true. I I I, I think I'm oh, lucky. I I'm lucky because I one grew up with a very healthy family life with parents yeah. who were very supportive of me. I, I I didn't have any of the toxic baggage with of feeling like I was, you know, a worthless person if I did, you know, or you know, being That's made it. to feel like I was a terrible person that needed religion, needed this specific form of Christianity in order to be loved by God. Did I never had any of that, right? That wow. was never nice. part of my world, you nice. know. So even though I I call myself a fundamentalist, I didn't have the the stereotypical fundamentalist experience with religion and with Christianity. Um, for me, uh, it was always an intellectual experience, an intellectual uh, journey of curiosity. When I was eight or nine years old, I used to take copious sermon notes on my on my church flyer bulletin because I wanted to, and I, then I would talk to the pastor afterwards and I grill him on on his Love sermon uh, to understand. You know, wh- what exactly did you mean by this passage here? Are you sure that's the right interpretation of that verse? You know, I would I was doing that from an early age, and so. Um, 
it was uh, it, it got to one point where my parents actually forced me to go to the children's school, the children's church, so that I wouldn't uh, you know pester the pastor with questions and write to, and ask them too many questions afterwards about the sermon. Um, <laughs> but it was uh, that was just my personality. So for me, um, theology and doctrine wasn't something about my worth as a person. My my worth wasn't at stake, you know. Nice. Rather, you have an amazing amount of freedom. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Total, total freedom uh, with supportive parents. Uh, and and so for me, deconstruction was like, oh, I, I guess I'm just going to discover new things in the world. Yay. You know, this is great. Mm-hmm. You know, awesome. <laughs> there, was, <laughs> there was none of the, the psychological damage uh, that I had to work through. Are you familiar with R.C. Sproul? Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yes. I don't know if you knew there was a huge debate. I mean, R.C. Sproul and John Piper were good friends, but the sad tr- truth of the matter is, is as a Pado baptist he wouldn't have ever been allowed to take communion at Bethlehem Baptist. And so there are there is that side of things. And I, I, I get the feeling that your family is the kind of people who would look at that and say, my God, aren't they not brothers in Christ? Um, well, and here... Or would they actually put the, would no, they no, actually no, put no, the my, my, my parents certainly would be, yes. They would not understand why that was such a big deal. That being oh, said, though, okay. got it. the extended family absolutely would. Got I, it. And, I, and my grandfather and my, and my father were, would come to near blows over creationism issues, uh, mm, you know, and yeah. there was a lot of animosity there among you know, family members, lots of fighting over these issues between my uncles, my uncles who were pastors or missionaries and were really deeply invested in the theological rightness of their beliefs. They definitely had a lot going on in terms of, you know, fighting with other people about these issues. My grandfather was a very cantankerous argumentative person and would, you know, when my, when my aunt and uncle, so his daughter and her husband, when they left to join the Roman Catholic church, that happened when I was in high school, my grandfather Scandal. wrote, my grandfather wrote his daughter a letter saying, you're on the road to hell, you know? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah. that was, that was just what you did. And so I, I never understood that way of thinking, uh, or at least that, that attitude of holding their doctrines. Um, I remember when I went to Wheaton, my, my the aunt and uncle who were who were Catholic uh, lived nearby, and I would go visit them because I I, I told them I, I I support you and I I am you know um, I think it's important that we embrace a wide spectrum of beliefs and ideas and I even if I am not I don't subscribe to Catholicism I respect your beliefs you know and so we we. Uh, I still, I'm still friends with them and they're, I'm closest with them, in my family. Um, and so it's, um, I, you know, so yes, I think it's, I was sort of at a unique place within my larger family landscape. I had a really unique experience and I'm grateful that my parents weren't invested in these issues because it might've changed my, my trajectory. No, it's solid. So I, I want to get to the book cause I want to dive in yeah. sure. uh, and I want to answer one question first. What was the story leading up to writing this book? It's a unique idea. Mm-hmm. Well, so the it book sounds like it's a passion. Um, it, it's in, in a way it is. I mean, I've you know I've written a lot on this topic now. <laughs> um, I say that because it, you said it was the most meaningful. It was, yeah. Well, um, so the, the story here is I I published a book in uh, 2016 uh, called The God Who Saves, and that book was my first full length, uh, entry into the question of universalism. Um, that book, uh, I, you know, I really poured my heart into that book. It, it's definitely more academic than I would like it to be. I, I, you know, a lot of people ask me to write a more of a, a layman's per- version of it, but, um, it is a, it, it, it's a full scale systematic theology around universalism. Um, the book got me fired from my job because uh, I was working for a Christian organization that uh, had a statement of faith. And um, so universalism uh, they viewed as being outside the bounds. And so I lost my job uh, there. And that's why I'm here now uh, in the Kansas city area uh, where I work at KU now. Um, So, you know, the, the issue of universalism, while it's also, well, it's very personal to me, it's personal in a lot of different ways. You know, in one sense, I, I care about the topic because I do think that, you know, it, without universalism of, of some kind, you know, uh, the God that pe- that we believe in turn would, is indistinguishable from a devil, um, in my view. 
so there's something something some version of it i think has to be right um but uh but also it's personal to me just because it's changed my life in both positive and negative ways. You know, it, the guy who saves and, and my blog series from, uh, from a decade earlier um, were both really important for me. You know, they were both personal uh, journeys of intellectual and theological spiritual exploration. Um, they got me a lot of attention. So I, got, I did a lot of speaking on this topic and it was, I was really meaningful, uh, but I also lost my job and had to uproot my family. So it was painful as well. Uh, so, so anyway, I, you paid the price. I think that's an important moment. I did. Yeah. You, did. you paid the price for this. It wasn't like it was some easy ride that you could ride on the coattails of your family. You had to earn it. Yeah. Which is why I dedicate this book. Uh, it, the, the, the dedication reads for all those who have, pro- for all those who have proclaimed a wider hope, even at the expense of their own livelihood. Mm-hmm. Um, that's awesome. there, are, there are a number of people who have, who have done that. And, um, so I put together this book proposal while I was still working at my previous job. Um, and, you know, uh, I pitched it to them initially to see if they would publish it. Uh, and, you know, they passed on it for, for very obvious reasons. Um, at that our audience, what's the title, David? Well, the, the current title is Varieties of Christian Universalism, uh, Exploring Four Views. I should say that when the book was, when I first pitched the book, it was going to be more of a multi-view book about universalism that would include anti-universalist positions as well. Uh, so it was going to be a full dialogue between the pro Counters and the con. And rebuttals. You know, yep. Yeah. Yep. And um, and in the so the book was accepted at, at Baker. Baker agreed to publish it. The but then I then I lost my job, <laughs> and then a couple of people who had agreed to write for the book no longer wanted to be associated with me <laughs> or didn't, didn't want to be involved in the project for <laughs> very, for various reasons. And so I lost a couple chapters from the book and kind of had to re reconstruct what this book was going to be. Um, I wasn't initially going to have a chapter in the volume. I was just going to be the moderator for the dialogue. Mm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so I was sort of struggling to know what to do with the book. It, it languished for years. Um, Cause I, I had, the other three chapters in this book were written. I think they were finished in 2017. You know, so did the they, book work in that direction? Did you feel like it worked? It, I think it would have worked in mm-hmm. its original version, but mm-hmm. I'm glad we didn't go that route because I think it's better. Good is not being an argument book. You know, Good. I'm glad it's not an argument about who's right. Mm-hmm. You know, which I, um, I'm glad it's not it- that. It's, I can think. I can see how the argument can almost get in the way of let's just focus on a really great idea. Yeah, the rebuttals will come later, but here's yeah, right. the idea. <laughs> yes, exactly. Well, so, and, and it's yeah. different than David Bentley Hart. De- David Bentley Hart bringing universalism well, so, to so, save the world, and he's so acerbic and he's so like like confrontational and in your face and belittling. And I love that we're, no, this is not, guys, the, the point is universalism, right? I mean, it's going past the the, the trials, the, the pain, the mistakes, and ultimately reconciling. That's the whole point. It's called reconciliation, <laughs> right, David? And I, you know, he I, gets to do I'm, what he gets to do, but true. thank you. Right. <laughs> well, so that book, so so Michael McClyman's The Devil's Redemption came out in 2018, and then David Bentley Hart's book, you know, um, uh, that came out in 2019. So that happened after my book was already under contract, after Got most it. of these chapters have already been written, and that was actually a big reason why I decided to shift away from that format because you had 100%. this pro con work already out there arguing about this issue. Um, and, and one of the things that McClyman's book and also Hart's book in another way, just made me realize we need to have, we need to be clear that there are different versions of universalism on the table. You know, Hart is, I, I, I love Hart's book, but it's also being Hart. He kind of bulldozes you and this is the only way to think, right? This is the yeah. only position to have. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the only position to have. I think that in many respects, I quite agree with Hart. Um, but there are plenty of other ways to think about this issue, plenty of other theological approaches to this topic that we should also listen to. And so that's the spirit in which I, I try to kind of re, refashion this volume and make it work. So um, Robin Perry, who's in the volume, um, 
uh, convinced me to write a chapter as well that would represent the view that I had written about in The God Who Saves. How did um, you feel about that? I you know I appreciated it and I think it was a, it was a good exercise for me because my own theology had shifted a bit since the God who saves that was you know since then and now it's eight years and my theology has undergone some some changes so uh, the chapter in here is I think an improvement in some ways on my on my book um, and uh, it was a good it was a good experience to to work through those ideas another time um, so I appreciated that from from Robin awesome. Um, yeah, so okay, that's kind so of where. Yeah, let's dive let's, into your existential um, aspect of it, shall we? And yeah, if you want to highlight there, some of the others, yeah, and then we'll we'll touch on each one. Okay. But give us yours because <sighs> yours sounds the most unique. It's the most unique, yeah. And you know, I'm I'm sure somebody like Hart or somebody would just say, you know, he's not part of the conversation, which is which is fine. <laughs> the floor is yours. <laughs> there's no rebuttal. Yeah, there's you know, no rebuttal right now. My. So uh, just a little bit more about my bio to understand this chapter and my where I'm coming from. Because um, in in between my blog series and this book, I I did a whole I did years and years of of scholarship and publication on an existential theologian named Rob, uh, Rudolf Bultmann. So mm-hmm. Rudolf Bultmann is a German theologian, New Testament exegete, yeah. very you know very famous back in the 50s and 60s. Um, and uh, I've, I've devoted years of my life to understanding his work. And I, one of the things that always troubled me about Boltmann and I, is that he's not, he's not a universalist. Um, mm-hmm. He doesn't think that there's a way to reconcile universalism with the existential claim of the gospel. Um, for him, to be existential means we have to respect the the each person's individual existence in the way in which we respond and, and follow Christ, you know, and there are people who are not going to respond, not going to follow Christ. And, and therefore there's no way to reconcile existentialism or an existential Christianity and universalism. Universalism speaks in these totalities, these grand totalizing visions. Right. And that's kind of antithetical to an existential approach to faith. So what I set out to do in both my previous book and then in this chapter more specifically is to set out an attempt to reconcile a universal salvation with a deep understanding and respect for the fact that faith is a personal and individual experience. Mm -hmm. And we can't lose sight of that. Um, And the way I, I brought those together was by using Dietrich Bonhoeffer's idea of unconscious Christianity. So Bonhoeffer, the, the martyr who was killed in the Nazi prison, um, he, uh, one of his you know, lesser known ideas that he develops early in his life, but then comes back to in his later prison writings is this idea of an unconscious Christianity, a Christianity uh, of what, what, of Matthew 25, a Christianity of that, uh, this kind of the faith of the child. He, he often talks about the, 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 the infant who's baptized as having this kind of this true direct faith in God Mm -hmm. that the faith of the adult doesn't quite have. They, when Mm -hmm. when you get to the adult stage, you have this more kind of reflective faith that sort of grasps a hold of, of, of God and and spirituality and tries to make it something for themselves. Whereas the, the child, the infant, the, the, the one who's not reflective is just purely in the grip of a reality outside of themselves. So, right? so, let me stop you real quick. Cause science has a really good explanation of how that's possible because until you're about nine, you have no prefrontal cortex, a child, like my grandson lives with me right now and I get to watch him. A child literally is just a feeling object. Mm-hmm. So yep. it gets the experience, but it has no capacity to judge it. Judge. Yep. And exactly. And to come online means you can now parse it and organize it and separate it. But that's the uniqueness of the naivete is you're right. just pure experience. That's pure great. awareness. Yeah. 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 No, I think that's spot on. That's really helpful. Yeah. Um, so I, I I took that idea from Bonhoeffer and just ran with it and said, what if what if we think about faith in this level this in this way, um, what does that do to the question of salvation? Um, and you know Bonhoeffer has a line. He has this one line in his, one of his prison writings where he says, unconscious Christianity: colon 
you know, maybe this is where we can go to for universalism, you know, or apocatastasis mm. is the word he uses. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so he just has this throwaway line. And I sort of develop an entire work around that one line in Bonhoeffer. And so what I'm trying to flesh out, and I don't think my approach is the only way to do this. There's other ways I think you could develop this idea is to say, what if saving faith is found primarily in this unconscious experience of being taken out of ourselves, moved outside of ourselves, maybe uh, encountering a reality of something be outside of our ego that, that draws us out of our, of our egocentricity and moves us out towards others. Yeah. You know, now that's, that's a broad kind of uh, generalized description of it. I, I think what, what, what I want to say is in Christianity, Christianity provides a more reflective articulation of this idea of grace, right? Of being drawn beyond ourselves towards, towards by God. Um, and, and it can provide an explanation for how that's possible and what that means, but that at some deep fundamental level, uh, that the, the, the kind of the original primal version of salvation is this experience of being taken out of ourselves. Like what did the disciples feel? That's kind of right. what you're talking about. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and that it's, it's not that Christianity is the only exclusive means by which that can happen. It's just the way of articulating what is happening for everybody at all times. Mm-hmm. Right. Every, every person is experiencing this reality. This ex- and, and what I want to say is that what Christianity provides, what Christian theology provides, is a way of describing this universal experience that happens throughout, throughout the world. And Christianity is articulating that in terms of a relationship to Christ that, that, you know, we can articulate it in however we want to articulate it, whether it's like the, the work of the spirit, you know, or, you know, uh, you know, we can, we can describe it in different doctrinal terms, but the point is it's a description of a universal experience that happens everywhere. And, and so what I'm, what I'm trying to propose is that that's, that's salvation happening right there. That is the work of God, the redemptive work of God occurring existentially in each person's life in an unconscious way, which then the church offers a conscious place to art, to articulate that unconscious experience. Okay. So let me explain what I hear you saying. <laughs> and then you tell me if that's it, is that <clears throat> the idea is essentially everyone's a Christian. Everyone is saved, but only a few have the conscious understanding of it and awareness. Is that what you're saying? That's what that's one way of saying it. I I, I want. I'm, How would you I'm, say it? I'm, you put the no. Words. That's 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 totally that's totally fair. I think I'm I'm trying to be careful of not describing other people as Christian um, well, unless, yeah. they're, unless they're conscious. Would of you it, use right? a word saved. saved. Like, what I would say like Christian. You can say or saved. Conscious. You can say yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, I think I think it's uh, it's this is a challenge I've been trying to internalize. I I because I I think I this is an important issue. I. I think within a Christian community, I could describe other people as unconscious Christians, right? That's what Bonhoeffer yeah, does. Fair. But I wouldn't tell them you are an unconscious an Christian. Hundred yeah. percent. I, I like human being yeah. better because I yeah. think that's more original and more uh, conscious to God's original understanding of it. But I think that's still limiting. I think I'm sort of reducing things down to I am because any words I put on are simply limiters. They're not. Sure. Describers, but they're ultimate limiters. They are. And so how does one in your theology move from unconscious to conscious? Well, I want to be clear that I don't think you, anyone has to move from unconscious to conscious. So I think that's, um, it's not a, an expectation that's, that must occur. There's no hell that they're right. going to experience for not believing. That's right. important. Right. Precisely. Right. Precisely. Yeah. Right. Um, um, and so, but because I do they're think they're already in. They're, yeah, they're in in that sense, right? The, the unconscious reality has already affected well, them. Well, can um, you tell me though? <clears throat> so, we've been we've studied a lot of things, and um, we studied um, why uh, at, in Johns Hopkins, uh, a whole bunch of stage four cancer victims who decided to undergo a psilocybin experiment, taking a hero's dose of mushrooms of five grams, 
Mm -hmm. um, came out of that with a feeling of absolute um, transcendent. It, it was as essential existent existence. Their experience transcended everything else they've been told. Right? They felt a loving cosmic presence. They didn't convert to Christianity, but there was something that happened mm -hmm. in their ego death, in whatever happened that helped them not only recognize a loving cosmic force, but also that they lost their fear of death. Absolutely, Same huge, huge concept death experience. Right? Yeah. Um, and, and so, but that that took something. It took a catalyst, right? People meditate. Um, we've got the early um, mystics, you know, yes. uh, Norwich. Um, you've got the contemplatives. Mm -hmm. All these people have, have have had some kinds of experience with the living God that that nobody can take away from them. And on their deathbeds or whatever, that's there. That became. I, I would still consider that a cosmic kind of thing. How do you actually tell? Uh, how do you? Um, identify these group of people as having this unconscious Christianity without having that revelatory moment that actually helped them get there. I don't know. You see them. You understand what I'm well, trying the, to get at? Yeah. 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 I see where you're getting. I think those are all cases of what I would call some sort of consciousness, conscious, yes. religious, conscious, conscious transcendence. Yes. Um, I, so I think those are all, those are all transitional stages where they've gone from the unconscious to the conscious. Um, I, I, I think that's, that part of what I, I think the church ought to be and what it, what it's largely not, but what it ought to be is a place that helps people make that transition from the unconscious to the conscious. Uh, it, it illuminates for people the, mm -hmm. you know, gives people a language and a vocabulary for the experiences they're already having, but don't have the lens to see. Right. The and unconscious the is, the, is, is, the, is the splinter in the mind's eye. Morpheus is telling Neo something is driving him mad. It's unconscious. He doesn't know what it is. Yeah. And that's when he breaks through and has that conscious ex existential experience of, holy shit, I'm in the real world now. So that's it. Something has been driving him unconsciously. Yes. Um, and it, yes. I think that that's where we have this idea, even in Romans 2, where you can even say, hey, boys and girls, the poor people who are dying um, after getting slaughtered, who've never heard the the voice of the word of God, they're mm -hmm. going to be okay because God has written on their hearts, this almost yeah. natural kind of conscience. Right. And yeah, so yeah, I love yeah. where you're going with this. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, go ahead. That's exactly what I'm, 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 yeah. And I think, you know, this is um, certainly many people have commented about this reality that even very conservative evangelicals are quite ready to articulate, you know, the, the, the kind of traces of transcendence that are all, all like woven into mm -hmm. e everywhere. I think the <clears> difference <throat> between my position and their position is that I'm ready to say that those people are already encountering salvifically the actual God, right? That, that it's not as if those are just moments that you can then use to apologetically get them into a belief in a doctrine and go to church and then, and then they're saved, right? You tithe, make sure and, you tithe. <laughs> exactly right. So I, I think that's how the, those those traces of transcendence typically are used apologetically as arguments to get people I, to to then go to church, subscribe to their doctrine, and then and then they can have the fullness of it. Right. Well, that's what and, Paul in Romans is saying that they're they're guilty because creation's already expressed his his goodness. <laughs> right. right. That 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 is their prerogative is to now go yes. and be better. You you've been given it right you, yeah, you've been yeah, shown yeah. evidence of of what's going on right yeah right so here's david here's the argument question i, I don't <clears> want to <throat> push too hard but i think this is a simple one to go after what is what is uh what does the world do with hitler in your theology mm. um i is he in well <laughs> yes <laughs> he is of course yeah absolutely no i mean Good. so it yeah. is fully inclusive it's fully inclusive. No, no, no. Right. No one, no one's out. No, no, no. Um, right. But uh, I, I, you know, I do talk about this a little bit in the end of my chapter in the book because um, I do think that it, one of the it's it's too it's very common, and yeah, of course you've already encountered this because you're asking me this question. But it's very common for people to try to have the slam dunk against universalism by using you know you know moments of real tragedy, real evil in the world, as say, look you know, this is why this can't be true. Um, and I think my, 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 my problem with that, that approach, a whole line of questioning is just that uh, it assumes that when um, the bad things in the world, um, that, that our understanding of God is to be the one who's going to deal with them. That the, that the point of a God, the point of believing in God is to have this cosmic judge to then ultimately 
basically bless me who is of course in the right and destroy mm-hmm. them who of course are in the wrong right now it's easy to use somebody like hitler and say well he's obviously he's the one in the wrong right but it, it, it's uh, i think well, he's use- simply an object lesson to say is there an exception because it's because right. it, if you ha- hitler's the tip of the spear you know you right it is hitler any one of those guys it's like this is is this the exception is there an exception and i think because that's the wrestling of the mind is universalism really all in? And that's what we wrestled with David. And that's kind of yeah. what, in your version, in your view, yeah. it is completely all in. Yes. Yeah, it is. They're all in. Um, but I also th- I think that the problems in the world that are very real, um, that uh, we need to take responsibility for them. I mean, I think we as humans uh, need well, that's to- That's the adult approach. Yes. That's, right, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and not simply punt to God as the one mm-hmm. who's going to uh, assign all the bad stuff over here and, and give us the good stuff here. Because, you know, and I think that's where we, you know, most of humanity just hasn't yet matured to a point of understanding that, uh, that God isn't there to basically play referee for, um, you know, that that's, that's a, that's a, a misuse, I think abuse of God. Well, uh, you can make a really good argument that God has been trying to tell us from the beginning of scriptures, all scriptures grow the fuck up. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> like, come on. That's the point is to grow yeah. up into love. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's not rocket science. It's not bad for you. It's good for your health mentally as well. Hey, <laughs> Like it, there's grace people like, yeah. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not yeah. going to punish you. You're going to punish yourself. So stop doing that and then grow up into love and realize, Oh, you actually have value. That's the thing is universalism leads to a theology of love because it says we, Hey, we're all in this together. There is no heaven and hell. There's just all of us together. Figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. right. So hundred percent. Okay. Right. So give us the next point of view. Uh, okay. Do you feel like you've closed, like you've given a good view? Um, I think that's, that's a, that's a, good. I think a good summary good. of my position. I mean, yeah. we can, there's certainly more to unpack if we wanted to, but let, let me go on what to some other, other ones. Yeah. So Robin Perry, um, I, maybe I should pair Robin Perry with the ancient uh, Christian uh, position. So part of what Marina Ludlow is doing in her chapter on, on patristic or early Christian universalism is to, to highlight what makes them unique. Uh, the patristic one and the evangelical ones are, are similar in a number of respects. They, they both accept that there is a punishment after death. There is a realm, mm-hmm. a hell, a hell like state, a, a, a realm of purgation that happens beyond death. Um, the, the the big difference, I think, well, there's a couple differences, but one di- one big difference between the patristic one and the evangelical one is just the conception of salvation itself. Um, the, the early Christians had a view of salvation more like uh, a medical healing process. You know, it was also, they used healing metaphors and they used education metaphors. So it was like a, it was a pedagogical hell or a, a medical hell, a hospital hell. So hell was a, a place to maybe purge you of the, of the, the, the bacteria that accumulated on your soul throughout the life. Antiseptic, right? if you would. Antiseptic, yeah. precisely, yes. Or it could also be described as a classroom where you were being re-educated, you know, like a re-education camp uh, for those who had been so corrupted in their in their minds and practices and habits through their life in the world that they they needed to be completely retaught how to be human, right? Um, how to how to be in the image of God, and so which is very in the, it, which I love about that is because it's very uh, restorative. It is. Like I said, hey, let's not throw you baby out with bathwater. There's a human being here. That, <laughs> right. That's what I love about it. Yes. I no, don't think for some it's painful enough, though. It seems like it's healing. <laughs> the, the colossus is what I want to talk about, the pruning. That's yes. what Barclay, well, Barclay uses, you know? Yeah, well, Mar- uh, Ludlow's chapter does. She, she gets into the painful parts, too. I mean, it was okay. certainly for Gregory of Nyssa and Origen and others. Uh, there was no shortage of pain uh, in okay. the afterlife. <laughs> there was there was definitely um, – sometimes they almost dwell a lot. They kind of uh, – they, they kind of, you know <laughs> – 
go at length about how painful it's going to be. Um, so they don't, they don't have any shortage of that, but, uh, but they do, it is all oriented toward a final redemption, a final healing and restoration, or in the case of Gregory of Nyssa though, it goes on and on forever. It never ends. It's a, it's so for him, it's not necessarily painful, but it is an ongoing process in which you will never arrive. So oh, for, for Nissa, it was not an ultimate reconciliation. It was well, there, it is, there is an EC, ECT it is, of sorts. It, it's hard to describe. So, I mean, it is an re- ultimate reconciliation, but the process of being purged or, or at least conformed to Christ is a never ending process. It's an eternal journey. So, his, his word for that is epictasis. Uh, it's this ongoing. A process that that will never be completed. It, it's an eternal journey. Um, hmm. We are always going deeper and deeper and deeper into God uh, for for Gregory of Nyssa. Okay. Um, so the other ones were a little had a little more of a, a static conclusion or at least a finality to it, but Nyssa is a bit more open ended. Um, so that's more of the ancient version of universalism. There's also other features of that, like. The redemption of Satan, for instance, those kinds of ideas. Oh, that's right. Yeah, of course. Right. right. You know, the angels, all, the, all the fallen the, angels. It's, and a, it's all a cosmic the, vision, right? It's yeah. it's the the whole heavenly hosts and the infernal demonic forces. All of it is included, right? It's all part of that. It's not mm-hmm. just human centric. Um, for the evangelical one, though, it is more human focused. It's more about us, about people, and it's less about that argument. Who made or the Perry. which Perry did that? Perry. Per- yeah, Robin, Robin, Robin Perry. The, yeah, Robin yeah. Perry. Did. Yeah. Now he he's not the originator of this idea. Uh, sure. He's simply he put it together. He's put it he together. Made. But um, and and what's great about his chapter in this volume is that he goes through the the history of evangelical universalism and really unpacks the various people who have espoused some version of this. And then, so it's an old view. It goes back hundreds of years. Um, but before I, George McDonald, did it go back before? Before um, that, Mc- yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back into the 1700s, even yeah, it okay. goes back a ways. Very yeah. cool. Um, but I think one of the distinguishing features of it is that there is kind of a, a very clear heaven and hell, um, and those who go and and in order to be saved, you do have to have a kind of a personal decision of faith. So it's a very evangelical view about faith as this personal commitment to Christ. That's the saving, you know, the saving moment, um, and. The the difference uh, here is so so for the for those who go to hell, uh, hell is a place that will that is designed to lead people to make their decision of faith for Christ. And it's like Earth, yeah, in some way, right? <laughs> <laughs> fair enough. Very fair. <laughs> uh, and uh, at some point, everyone will. That's the idea for right. for Perry's vision. Um, so there's less of this kind of purgative, ongoing journey of of mm-hmm. uh, educa- education and and healing. It's more of this decision based focus on salvation. So would you say that it's one of the things that I loved about um, David Artman's um, is he gets the Calvinistic and Arminian on both sides. So grace is for all, and the Arminian and grace saves completely right on the Calvinist side. And he says there's the, there's both. So would you say that there is still, is that more of like a free will kind of thing? Or do you think that God is still actually the uncaused cause the actual him? He is doing the drawing to them ultimately in in that regard. Yeah. For the evangelical position, I think it's sort of similar to Artman's. Um, It is trying to reconcile a bit of the Calvinist and a little bit of the Arminian. Um, I mean, I think, Robin Perry's evangelical approach probably falls more on the Arminian side on the issue of what is salvation, right? It's not a divine decision of election, right? It's, it's a personal decision of faith. Um, that being said, you know, he is trying to show how elements of both Calvinism and Arminianism can be held together. Um, and that there's a way of kind of surpassing that divide. Mm. Yeah, that that's not so much in this chapter, but I think Thomas Talbot in his book is an example of that. If you might know his work, um, uh, and so yeah, I think you shall bow, right? Yeah, I think he talks. Yeah, I think he um, quotes the one day every time will confess your God. One day every um, knee will bow, right? Yeah, right, right, and exactly. not in forced obedience, but an actual acquiescence, an actual my Lord, my God, exactly. kind of thing, which is which is a great visual, right? Of course, yes, 
Yeah. David, was there a fourth? There's a fourth. So the fourth one is what's called a Bardian or post Bardian universalism. Uh, this is an attempt. I'm interested to, in this one because I, yeah. I love Bart. Bart's great. Uh, I think what you know what's interesting about Bart is that he he's a reformed or or broadly Calvinist you know theologian working in that re- tradition. Um, and what he does in the 1930s and 40s is to rethink election, divine election, or predestination. Um, he comes to a very strong critique of Calvin on this point and the Calvinist tradition. Um, and, and whereas the Calvinist tradition said that God elects individuals, you know, mm-hmm. individuals for salvation, others for condemnation. Yep. Bart says election is first and foremost and really only about Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one who is the God who elects because he's God but he's also the one who is elected as human. And so what Bart does is say election is really all about Jesus. And only secondarily, it's all also about all humanity because all humanity is included in the humanity of Mm -hmm. Jesus. Mm -hmm. His humanity is our humanity and therefore his election is our election. Right. In other words, it's a one for all. It's a scapegoat. It's the one for all. It's saying, universe- you need yeah. the universal yeah. scapegoat. Here it is. I don't need to do it anymore. Is that what you're saying? In, in some ways. I mean, that's a right. you know, Rene Girard way of describing it. Yes. Uh, yeah. The scapegoat okay. theory idea. But yes, I mean, for, for him, yes. So he's the, the way that Bart puts it is Christ is the judge judged in our place. Mm-hmm. So uh, the divine judge is also the one who is judged as human. And he's done that for all on behalf of all. Um, David, were you a yeah. part of any of the emerging church conversation or follow any of that? I yes, I was. I was. Uh, I was actually part of an emerging church when I was at Princeton. Were? Yeah. Oh. yeah. Wow. Oh, which one? Well, it, it, at that time, it's no longer around, but it was called the Well. Uh, yeah, it was. I know the Well. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I was on the board of Emerging Village. That's, That's why I asked because that was sort of the beginning of deconstruction and challenging a lot of these ideas. At least for me, it was when it became kind of bigger news and the emergent church, I think gave people permission to deconstruct, you know, the conversations were these pods of people just saying, well, I'm gay. So can I get into heaven? You know, things like that, very real conversations about what does it mean to be a human being and how does God fit into that? And I think it would, and that's when the rapper came off for me Mm -hmm. and kind of really wrestling with the idea of it. Um, when you said it started around 2005, because mine started around 2008. Yeah, uh, 2005. That's when I started uh, my my MDiv program at Princeton Seminary, and that's when I started my blog about universalism. Um, I I I came to to Princeton basically already ready to say I'm a universalist. I was just kind of on the cusp. I just I just wanted to read a little bit more. And then say, okay, now now I'm ready to go. You know, I just wanted to have a little bit more under my belt before I was ready to tackle it. Um, At that point, did what did you feel like you had the argument made in your head, or you had the belief in your head? Which, because for me, it was <sighs> what I realized is is that I believed it when I thought I had it, and then I realized, oh God, I didn't know anything. And then you I learn think- more, and then you realize that's what David Artman, David Artman, <laughs> put it all together for me. Did yeah. you have that at that time? I I had the belief. Um, I didn't quite have the argument, and that's mainly because I hadn't read much theology at all mm-hmm. before, okay, I got, before, before I got before I got to Princeton. Yeah. So I didn't. Yeah. I I wasn't ready to do it. But you know, one of the things that I when I read David Bentley Hart's book, for instance, he, Hart talks about in the very beginning of his book, he talks about how um, he never really he never really uh, was intellectually ever comfortable with the idea of hell, you know, from a child, from his childhood. Right. And I really resonated with that. I, I never, I was never a hard line believer in, in the traditional heaven, hell doctrine uh, growing up. I, it was, um, so like, so for, for me, you know, uh, you know, becoming a, a, an explicit, outspoken universalist was not that much of a step for me. The belief was already there. I think it had been there for a long time. I just didn't have the freedom to say and articulate it. 
you know, until until I was sort of really and fully and truly outside the realm of evangelicalism. You know, I was at Princeton Seminary where yeah. I could say whatever I wanted now, you know. What was that? Did you like the freedom there? Oh, I loved the freedom there. It was great. You know, uh, it was it was very uh, it was it was such a liberating experience for me to be surrounded by people who um, didn't care what my you know where my theolo- my theology was going because they were already there themselves or were doing some other thing. You know, it was I I could really develop myself without feeling constrained or pressured to go a certain way. Well, I like that. And the polemics are kind of out the door. It's actually a, an open co-creation of ideas and mm-hmm. an alignment of things. And the stuff that doesn't really make a lot of sense, you just kind of leave it by the side instead of decimate somebody, right? I, I do believe that, God bless David Artman, um, <laughs> he still likes to do, he asks us these questions. We, we were on his blog and he's like, okay, do you affirm this? Okay, good. Jonathan and Rich, do, do you check, check? Check. We right? and, and it's cool. questions. It was awesome. Yeah, it, it, it was a 20 questions thing. And I think that's going to be helpful. There's going to be people mm-hmm. on the apologist side that are going to need to have, you know, the, what do you call it? Uh, the case for Christ kind of guy, Lee Strobel. Yes. You oh, know, yeah. you're going to have to have, up. <laughs> yeah, you're going to have to have that kind for certain. And then you're going to have to have this general kind of, hey, let's talk about the character of God and what, what, what the plan is and like how we actually come together in this idea, right? And it's like, the, the, and that, that's where I think the most healthy kind of conversations come into play. And then you start to build and you start di- get differing angles. And here's the early church fathers. And here's this kind of really philosophical, um, strong, you know, foundation for it. And over here, by the way, there's some pretty good scripture for it too, right? Um, in, in terms of, of of where this is going. So um, anyway, yeah, this is this has been awesome. David, when did you realize you could say it with comfort? <clears throat> Well, universalism. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it really we're wasn't. All to, we're all going to heaven. We're all going to be in the same place. I, I wasn't comfortable <laughs> saying it. I wasn't comfortable saying it until I got to Princeton. Oh, um, no. okay. Okay. I think I just needed to be um, out of Wheaton and also away from my family context. You know, it was, uh, it, I, I, I could be anonymous there for a bit. You know, and I think that really allowed me to uh, speak freely for once. I think that was really what was the, the difference for me. And you got your uh, MDiv or your or your? Well, I did my uh, I did my MDiv and then I did my PhD there as well. Got it. So oh, I stayed wow. on. Um, that wasn't the plan initially, but uh, you know, pretty quickly I learned that that's this is what I wanted to do with my life and. Uh, Bruce McCormick was was who I went there to study with. Uh, I had uh, heard of him when I was at Wheaton. He came to Wheaton when I was there to do, to speak for the theology conference at Wheaton College, and my professors at Wheaton said you should go study with him. Uh, yeah. So, um, so I made that decision really without investigating it further. I was like, okay, if that's what they said to do. I'll, I'll do it. <laughs> I I hadn't read any of his works, you know, before I went to before I went to Princeton. I just knew that uh, he was the person to study with, and you know, I made the right choice. He was a great advisor, great professor. Um, really awesome. uh, taught. He he gave me freedom to develop my theology, uh, and but also to do it in a in a rigorous way. You know, he he forced me to be careful and and, and rigorous in my thought process. Speaking of rigorous in thought process, um, your book, would you say that it's easier to read than David Bentley Hart's stuff and maybe even <laughs> Karl Barth's uh, epistle? To the, uh, what is it? He did a commentary on the Romans, didn't he? Um, you yes, know, he did. Let, right. us, let our audience know if it's pretty um, uh, approachable and, and kind of winsome or is it is, is it a little bit heady and, and have a there, caveat for that. So this, Yeah, so the book is um, – there are elements of it that are a little bit heady, but overall it's written in a winsome and, and accessible way. Um, I've Great. tried to make it as uh, – you know, it's probably – it's an undergraduate level, you know, um, for – you know, maybe at a, maybe a slightly advanced undergraduate level, but not too advanced. Um, but certainly that doesn't require you to have a degree in theology to – David, awesome. let, me ask you, let me ask you a different way because the content of the book is really perspectives – why should someone, Sally living in Cleveland, why should she care about this idea? Because you spent a long time writing this book. Why do you think it was valuable for someone like her? I mean, I think the, the question of salvation is 
at the heart of the faith. It's at the heart of, of Christianity and it's, it touches on, 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 it touches on things at, at a very deep kind of almost primal level. Right. Um, it, Cause fundamentally what we want to know is, is our God a loving God? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. can we, can, is, is the God that we, that we worship a God worth worshiping? Mm-hmm. Like that's, at the root of everything we do, like we have, to, we, we want to know that that's true, you know? And I think, um, so this question, we, we can't escape it, right? We can't escape this issue of, um, is our God a good God, right? Is the God of Christianity a good, just, and loving God? Now, certainly people are going to dif- dis- disagree <laughs> on what that means to be just, to be loving. Um, and I think that's what, and that's okay. I think I think disagreement is is fine and healthy. Um, I think the the reason why this book is help, hopefully helpful is to show that there's a, there's a lot of people who I know who are asking like I really want to know that my you know that my uh, you know Buddhist neighbor is going to be you know with God for eternity, or I really want to know that that my that my brother in law who left faith and is now atheist is is going to be you know, held by God for all, for eternity in God's love. Right. Like I want to know that, you know, I want to, I mm. want, I, and, and they want to know, they want to say it, they want to believe it, but they don't know that they can, they don't know how, you know? And I think this book is offering people a, a vision for Christianity that shows you, yes, this is possible. There are, Christianity is, is a vast and multiple and, and, and complex and beautiful family of ideas and beliefs. You know, there's not just one Christianity that you, that you either, if you have it or you don't, right. Um, Christianity is a huge family of ideas and we, and there's a, there's a place within it for somebody to say, everyone is saved. Everyone is, is held in God's grace and, and you don't have to, wrestle with this tension of like trying to try, trying to square a circle um mm. these things can be held together and and here's here are a few different ways that it can be so uh final question and rich i'll let you ask one more um how did it change your life to to step into that freedom and then write a book about it which is kind of like saying okay here's a bullhorn of what I believe, but it's a very powerful message. How did it change your life? Um, well, losing my job was, was a, <laughs> a negative way that changed my life. Um, I mean, on the whole, you, though, you could have fit in that culture for a long, for a long time. Sorry. Uh, oh, could I fit? Could fit uh, that? <laughs> that's a good question. I don't know if I could have, I, think I couldn't, it, I had to, yeah. I had to step out. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm glad not to be there and I'm glad to be where I am. I mean, it, yeah. it was the right thing for me. Um, it was just a very painful, painful. Yeah. Thing and it was remember. painful. Yeah. 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 Sometimes it's, yeah. It's <laughs> yeah. It's, it's part yeah. of, that's part of the growth process. Um, you went through the pain and yes. what did you get out of it? Well, um, what I got out of it was a, was a sense of solidarity oh. with those who have also lost their jobs and lost their positions for, for, for their convictions. You know, I, I had known, I mean, Peter Enns was somebody who I had known when I was at Princeton, he had lost his job at Westminster seminary Westminster. while I was, yep. while I was at Princeton. Um, and he used to come up to Princeton a lot and we would talk sometimes. And, um, so when that happened, and then I, I've had other friends of mine who were who lost their jobs. My, the philosophy professor introduced me to Augustine, who I told you about. He lost his job at Wheaton College for becoming Catholic when he was when I was there as a student. Um, so there have been a number of people in my life who had been forced out of their positions and 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 kind of exiled from the communities in which they were establishing themselves, and um, and that experience losing my job was certainly a life-changing moment for me in terms of, of coming to grips with that and realizing um, what all that involved. Um, but, uh, but I, I mean, I don't want to dwell on that too much. I mean, I think the, the, the universalism is by and large a very positive thing for me. It's not all about my, my experience, but it's really more about. Um, no, but I meant, what is um, it? I think what I'm asking yeah. is you went through the pain of yeah. declaring I am a universalist. What was the value of holding on to that experience? 
of, of holding on to a universal faith that says, yeah. Hey, we're all of the same cloth here. Um, I think training and empathy, I think, uh, training, a, a vision to see others as, as already saved is already in God's grace. Um, learning not to see the world in terms of an us and them dichotomy as between, between, you know, the rejected and, and the, and the redeemed. Um, I think that's part of the pernicious legacy of the doctrine of hell has been to cultivate uh, a vision of the world in which there's them and then there's us. Uh, and, and that line of divide is between the good and the evil, between the lost and the, and the saved, between, you know, and, and, and that vision of the world is it can be so toxic, it can be so damaging, and and it has tendrils that go out into all kinds of other areas, in ethics and polit- politics and all the rest. And what I think universalism has done for me and for and for others, and what it still does, is to 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 cultivate an alternative way of being in the world, um, to train me into seeing everyone as as connected to each other. And to God. Love it. All right. I got an easy one. Uh, was C.S. Lewis a leaky universalist? <laughs> uh, sure. I think, you know, All right. so Lewis was a very important part of my life as well. I should say, I mean, I, I, I were, worked at the C.S. Lewis archives at Wheaton college my entire time. I was there. I was actually the, awesome. the I was the student editor for the C.S. Lewis journal that they produced called seven at the, at the Marion Wade center. Um, I was deeply involved in. I, I went on a on a Lewis, C.S. Lewis trip to Oxford as part of the Wheaton College uh, as a student there. So I spent a summer in Oxford and went to the kilns and went to. Did you like his theology or or, or uh, writings? I'm. I, I mean, at that point, it was more his writings, his fiction, especially you know, nice. Tilia's faces yeah. and you know yeah. those, those those works. Um, but the Great Divorce was was a, a, oh my a, God, that's a, one of my favorites. It's a beautiful book, and I, it was a pivotal moment for me um, to to read that work and really really ponder it. And it did lead me to read uh, George MacDonald, who I read yep. also, and a I'm, mentor of C.S. Uh, yes, C.S. Lewis. Yeah, uh, I loved his Jonathan. work. You know, read fantasies and other other works, and so. Um, Lewis was important for me. Absolutely. And I, I, I do think he's much closer to a universalist than the evangelicals want him to be. A hundred percent. And when I, when, when you first said the fire and the rose as your blog, I'm thinking the child and the egg, um, <laughs> right. I'm just thinking, okay, is this the, um, inklings, you know, are we talking Tolkien and, and uh, Lewis? Are it, you- it, it's a line from T.S. From Eliot's Four Quartets, actually. Okay. There you go. It is, it, it's line. definitely in the same vicinity though. It's in the same realm for sure. I love it. Well, that's I, I. I can't wait to. Um, I can't wait to um, dive into the book. I can't wait to hear more and chat more about you. Um, I, I think that we're hearing from um, David Artman that he's really trying to get uh, an actual kind of a conference together. Um, you know, that's going to get a, a meeting of the minds together. There's nothing like a, you know, Big Ten Christianity that we would have seen with Brian McLaren days and what do you call it, the Wild Goose? You know, yes, well, sure, to, Wild Goose. Yeah. yeah. But maybe a smaller, like a microcosm of, of some of those bigger things. But it would be a great thing to get a little bit more visibility and some great speakers and um, some 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 people attending. You know, it seems like something could be, be on the horizon. You could bring a lot of people to it. David, thank you very much for joining us. This has been an absolutely <clears throat> wonderful conversation. Oh, thank yeah. you so much for having me. It's wonderful. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. This is, again, every week is just so much fun. This is going to be an incredible, this is our third this week and it's been absolutely incredible. Hope you enjoy them. Please comment, review, let us know, send us email and uh, let us know what you'd like us to talk about. Or if you have a guest you'd recommend, please send them. They're so much fun when you do that. Uh, So have an awesome week, weekend, everybody. It's Friday here (laughs) and uh, much love everybody. Thank you.